This episode of Ben Franklin's World is brought to you by Cornell University Press. If you're like me, then you have a lot of questions about history you'd like answers to. For example, one question I used to think about was, what did the Continental Congress do with all the Continental Army's prisoners of war? Because throughout the course of the war, you're talking about more than 13,000 British and German soldiers. So where did the government house them all? Fortunately, Cornell University Press helped my brain stop asking this question because it published a book with answers. It's called Dangerous Guests, Enemy Captives and Revolutionary Communities During the War for Independence. In Dangerous Guests, historian Ken Miller helps answer the POW question by offering an intimate look at Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which over the course of the war hosted over 3,000 British and German POWs. Now, Congress thought that Lancaster was the perfect place to keep enemy POWs because it sat about 80 miles inland from the coast, so that limits escape opportunities, and it boasted a diverse population of Britons, Germans, African Americans, Scots, and Scots-Irish, a population that could communicate with all of its diverse captives. But what Congress may not have known was that this diverse community wasn't a coherent one. Many populations within Lancaster had fairly strong ethnic identities. Plus, the revolution added a lot of political tension to the mix. Like a lot of American communities, Lancaster was home to patriots, loyalists, and many who tried not to choose a side. But what may surprise you, and it certainly surprised me when I read this book, is that the enemy captives actually helped bring the community's diverse population together. The presence of these POWs helped to override local, ethnic, and religious prejudices by creating a sense of national American identity. To find out more about how enemy captives helped Americans identify as Americans and what life was like for British and German POWs and their American hosts, check out episode 48, where Ken Miller will take you through this fascinating story. You'll find a link to the episode and one to Ken's book, Dangerous Guests, on the show notes page. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 113 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. After seven long years of occupation, Americans found New York City in shambles after the British evacuated on November 25, 1783. 10 to 25% of the city had burned in 1776, and the British had used just about every other building that remained to billet officers, soldiers, refugees, and their horses. Plus, more refugees and animals crammed into vacant lots, streets, and alleyways. So, needless to say, New York City stood in need of a lot of repair after the Revolution. Which raises the question, how did New Yorkers rebuild New York City? Where did they get the money to rebuild, improve, and encourage the economic development that would transform the city into the thriving metropolis and economic hub that it would become? Brian Phillips Murphy, an associate professor of history at Rutgers University, New York, will take us through part of this amazing story by sharing details from his book, Building the Empire State, Political Economy in the Early Republic. During our conversation, Brian reveals what political economy is and how New Yorkers used it to order their state's economy after the War for Independence, the founding of the Bank of New York and its rival, the Manhattan Company, and why New York built the Erie Canal as a state-funded public project. But first, as you know, the holiday season is upon us. It's a time when we visit friends and family or do the next best thing and send them a holiday card. This makes the holiday season the perfect time to tell friends and family members about your favorite podcasts, like Ben Franklin's World. Sharing your favorite podcasts can be a wonderful conversation starter, and it's a great gift too because not only does your recommendation help out your friend or family member by giving them something great to listen to, it also helps out your favorite podcasts and podcast hosts by helping them reach new listeners. Are you ready to find out how New York became the Empire State and how New York City rose to economic prominence? Let's go meet our guest historian. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Joining us is an associate professor of history and the director of the Honors College at Rutgers University, Newark. He's a contributing editor at Talking Points Memo and a member of the board of editors of the Governor Morris Papers. Today, he joins us to discuss details from his book, Building the Empire State, Political Economy in the Early Republic, which won the James A. Broussard Best First Book Prize from the Society for Historians of the Early American Republic. 
Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Brian Murphy. Thanks, Liz. Happy to be here. Brian's book, Building the Empire State, is an exploration into how the idea of political economy evolved within New York State in the 50 years following independence. Brian, what is political economy? I mean, is this a real concept that we use today, or is this just a theoretical concept that scholars like to use to study the past? It's changed over time. You know, a lot of the people that we study in early America are students of political economy or consider themselves to be. And in the 18th century, political economy is more or less, it's a study of economics and how markets and production and consumption work within the framework of the nation state. You know, you can think of like Rousseau is writing about this, right? European theorists who are grappling with the moral dimensions of how economics work. And they're not really thinking of it as pure economics yet because that field doesn't really exist yet. So it's the sort of precursor to economics as we know it, situated very much within the developing nation states of continental Europe and Britain and of course empires. And it's them trying to make sense of not only how markets work, but with the moral implications of transactions and consumption and production are and how they relate to policy and statecraft. So today, when we think about it, right, economics itself gets kind of cleaved off into its own field. Today, when we talk about political economy, we're mainly referring to either sort of a Marxist approach to thinking about how ideology affects economic policy, or we're looking at how, and this is where I operate and where I think most people who do write in political economy operate. It's an interdisciplinary look at how politics, economics, and I guess maybe you know, material culture and consumption studies all come together and intersect with regard to policy and happen within a framework of federalism in the American nation, right? That is, you, know, you have policies that are happening and being crafted and transactions and market relationships that are being formed and affected by the fact that they're happening within municipal and county and state and at a national level as well. Now, you had 13 states to choose from after the revolution, 14 if you want to count Vermont, which entered the union in 1791. Mm -hmm. So why New York? Why study the development and ideas of political economy within that state? So you're a Boston Red Sox fan, and we have a natural rivalry here as me being someone who's a Yankees fan, right? I mean, the New York is the center of the universe. I grew up outside of New York. I've always personally been interested in how New York became the place that it is, right? Where today you have this incredibly influential media apparatus that's situated there. And it's also the same town where you have the financial capital of the world. And I was interested in how the financial side of it became what it is today and what the origins are of that. So for me, it was kind of a the local story. I mean, it's a global story, but for me, it's very much a local story. And I was interested in how New York, you know, New York is a little bit different than its sister colonies turned states. You know, it's not a plantation economy. It doesn't have the same origins as New England does necessarily. It isn't even really as important as Philadelphia until the 19th century. And so I was interested in how New York became, you know, what tools New York and New Yorkers used to transform their influential but not dominant role in early American trade and commercialism, how that developed into something that by you know, the 1840s, 50s, 60s is recognizable as a really predominant position in the nation. And so, you know, part of its history and part of it's just this opening in the historiography that I was curious about. And part of it was, you know, when I was thinking about this in 2002, you know, I'd been a financial reporter in New York and was fascinated by a couple different stories that I vaguely knew about because they're important to the history of New York banking, which, you know, not exactly the hottest topic in the early aughts, but something that was kind of a curiosity for me. And you know, I had to pick up a, a master's thesis topic in the Manhattan Company, which later becomes Chase Manhattan and J.P. Morgan Chase, you know, that origin story was something I could latch on to. Well, clearly we need to agree to disagree over what the center of the universe is. But we do agree on the fact that New York State is a really fascinating place to study. And I think it would be helpful if we had a baseline for what we're about to explore. So, Brian, how did New York order its economy and operate within that ordered economy after the war for independence? After the end of the American Revolution, maybe we can think of it as the last day of the American Revolution, evacuation day, the British forces 
hand over New York City to the Americans, right? New York City has been occupied by British forces for longer than anywhere else in the 13 colonies. And when the patriots come back in, they find a city that's suffered under occupation in the ways that we might imagine, right? Been deforested, people have taken to looting homes and burning furniture and doing all the things that a city that's suffered from a fire and then was vaguely under siege and just didn't have great access to the interior. Exactly what you'd expect to find, right? One of the things, though, that's wrong if you care about the city's position relative to other cities on the eastern seaboard, and you're thinking about how to begin a recovery, one of the big problems that you have is that when British forces leave, a lot of the people who leave with them are these you know, loyalist merchants and traders and people engaged in commerce who you know, would be your natural go-to folks if you were thinking about how to reestablish domestic and international trade in the city. And they don't just leave carrying the information and skills that they have in their heads. They leave carrying bags of coins and they leave with you know, essentially the 18th century version of their Rolodexes, all of their connections and contacts. And that's really the stuff that makes trade work. So New York is in this position where they have to begin building a physical infrastructure or repairing what had been their physical infrastructure. They're interested in reigniting trade and regaining their position as an important trading post in the Atlantic world. And the New York State Legislature is one of these new 13 state governments doesn't have a ton of money on hand. And so the only way that they really see forward is something that's pretty familiar to them as one-time British colonists. And that is you have this legal toolkit on hand where you've got the ability to charter corporations and you've got the ability to give out monopolies and you can give out patents and you've got land that you can sell. And you've got some legal tools on hand that you can use to mobilize and move privately held capital in a direction that you would like to see things go in, right? You can coerce the movement and investment and deployment of capital by granting legal privileges and passing laws and doing stuff that doesn't cost you anything to do, right? It's a revenue neutral way for a state to begin enacting a policy program without having to spend any money or collect any taxes, or in their view, really, they don't have to give very much up. New York would make use of this legal toolkit a lot during the early Republic period. And one of the first tools that they used was the ability to incorporate a private bank. Mm -hmm. Brian, would you tell us why New Yorkers sought to create a bank and why they created a private bank instead of a public bank? This is what hooked me on this story. You have the British evacuation from New York. That's in November of 1783. By February of 1784, we're talking a matter of weeks here. You have the chancellor, right? The sort of the top judge in the state of New York, this guy, Robert Livingston. He is at the head of a group of people who are trying to start a land bank. They're land rich and cash poor. So this is a bank that would let them deposit and mortgage their existing land holdings and get cash in exchange for it. That group is working the found something called the land bank. You've got a second group of people who are headed up by a group of former Revolutionary Army officers who were also merchants in the city of New York. They're interested in founding a bank together with some remaining former loyalist merchants in the city. And you've got Alexander Hamilton, whose brother-in-law, John Church, has put him in charge of a pile of money and said, Alex, I want you to go found some kind of bank in the city of New York. So there are three groups of people who are working by February to create a bank in New York City. Right? That is their first instinct after British evacuation and thinking about how to reestablish New York's economy. And one of the inspirations I think they have for doing so is that once you get rid of the king, the power to create a corporation, which is a legal instrument that lets you or I get together and create a fictional legal person that can represent us in court and in lawsuits, and we can sue and be sued as a legal person. It lets us form a board of directors and sell shares and have perpetual life beyond our involvement with the institution. We can come and go as we please. The ability to create that particular institution, once you get rid of the king, passes to states. 
And so the New York State Legislature inherits this power, this sovereign power to create corporations. And there are people who recognize that and would like to immediately take advantage of it. And they begin organizing a bank because if you want to be able to engage in commerce and trade, you want to be able to gather cash, you want to be able to make loans and provide credit to people, the best way to do that is to have the legal protection that comes with incorporation. And so it's this moment when you think that the state's priority for reestablishing the economy and the priority of these citizens to reestablish their economy and get some political foothold and put themselves at the center of the new economic institutions that are going to exist in this new country, those priorities are aligning. It's a little trickier because people are also really suspicious about corporations because they're royal, because they're really privileged, and because the model that you would go to is, you know, you think like, what's the most important corporation that people are probably aware of in the 18th century? It's either the Bank of England, right? Or it's the British East India Company, neither of which are particularly popular institutions among Americans at this point. So it's a tricky needle that they have to try to thread here, right? You're making this sort of sovereign, domestic, you almost view it as like this nationalist, possibly patriotic argument that we have the power to do our own corporations now, and so we should. The downside of that is that there are a lot of people who say, wait a minute here, we didn't just fight a war so that we can just, you know, recreate all of the tyrannical institutions of our former colonial masters and set them loose ourselves. And so there's what's going to be at stake in the fight over this in the 1780s is is what's the proper role of a corporation, if there's any at all, in American political economy. But a question about being why you would want to create a private bank instead of a public bank, that category becomes complicated once you bring incorporation to the mix, because maybe it'll be a private bank. And for a while, the Bank of New York, when it doesn't have a charter, a corporate charter from the state of New York, is going to effectively operate as a private bank. That is, there's no liability protection for the people who are investors in the bank. They're not operating with any state sanction. They don't have any official recognition. They're not playing any public role by law. But as soon as they get a charter, they're not really a public bank because it's private capital that's involved, but they're operating under public sanction and with the support of a public law and a publicly granted privilege. And so they're in this gray zone where you know, the question about what's public and what's private becomes very complicated once you begin involving the issuance of corporate charters. And so they're not really, right, the bank that these guys are trying to form isn't really private and it isn't really public. It's a bit of both. How did the Bank of New York operate? I mean, did banks in early America operate like banks today? No. <laughs> right. So if you think about how we relate to a bank, I like to ask students this because I'm at the age where I have a home and I have to pay for child care. I have checks that I have to write, some every week, some every month. My students today tend to just use debit cards or do everything electronically. So they're not really using checks. But if you think about what an 18th century bank does, that creates the ability to write a check. And so a check is an IOU saying, I don't have $1,000 in gold coins on me right now. And there are good reasons for that. Gold coins are heavy. I could lose them. You know, they're inconvenient to carry. I could get robbed. I'd rather not carry them. It's much easier for me to carry this piece of paper with the name of my bank on it and my name on it. And I can give you that. And then you can go to the bank and you can just go get the money yourself. That's an easier way to do things. Banks in the 18th century are creating the ability for people to do that. Except it's not really for regular people. It's for people who are engaged in commerce. And it's creating the ability of people in commerce or engaging in trade to be able to, basically it's giving the ability to have credit. They don't have to have cash on hand for everything that they want to do. They can write someone a check. That person can hold on to the check for a while. Maybe they'll pass the check on to someone else. Checks are being used in a different way than we know today. Right? Checks are being used kind of as a substitute for cash and they're being passed around two, three, four times before they're actually brought to a bank. And sometimes even then, the term on them is just renegotiated. Usually it's for 90 days, but sometimes you can make that even longer. So they're functioning as a substitute for coins because there's not a good stable supply of paper money at this point. And especially in a place like New York, there's so many different kinds of paper money being used. It's pretty hard to get a hold of gold or silver coins. And when you do, it's hard to hold on to it because at various points, British merchants and just overseas merchants insist on being paid in gold and silver. And so even if you have gold and silver, it's going to be very hard to hang on to it. So if you want to do anything domestic, and if you want to give yourself any breathing room, you really need this instrument of the check. 
and banks are going to be involved in creating that for you. So it's the facilitation of credit and it increases your ability to create a network of people who you can engage in commerce with and engage in business with without needing you know, a ton of gold coins up front with you at all times. They're serving an explicitly commercial purpose here. It's not like you or I, as regular folks, would just walk down the street to the Bank of New York and open an account and then start depositing our weekly or monthly pay there. They're serving a very specific business-oriented purpose. And so, you know, the way that they work kind of reflects that. Unlike today in and I'm sure anybody listening to this in a city is going to feel this. There are so many banks on every corner in New York City, right? It's banks and drugstores. And it's not like that back then, right? The Bank of New York can have its office on the second floor. They don't have to have a storefront office. You can go up the stairs to the office and on one particular day of the week or maybe two days a week, you can bring your check there if you want to get money for it. You'll bring it there. You'll leave it there overnight. If it gets approved by the board of directors and they're going to scrutinize every piece of paper that comes in asking for money just to be sure that there aren't any counterfeits and to make sure everybody's account is fully funded and that they're not creating a legal problem for themselves down the road, they'll go over these individually and they have enormous amounts of discretion in who gets credit. You'll go in one day, drop the check off, and if it's approved, you're going to be able to pick up the money the next day. Right? So you're not getting instantaneous access to your money, but you know it happens regularly enough and with posted hours and with a process that people understand to be an effective tool in aiding the growth and propagation of business. I guess if we think about this from New York State's point of view, banks were actually really helpful institutions because... None of the colonies turned states had a lot of hard currency in circulation. Mm -hmm. And while banks weren't necessarily creating money, they were creating credit networks that could be used to repair roads and buildings and anything else that needed to be fixed after the revolution. Mm -hmm. Now, it also seems like banks performed some sort of political service, too, in that by 1800, banks were acknowledged to have become political institutions. Brian, how did banks evolve into and operate as political institutions? Perhaps you could tell us about the Manhattan Company. So they're always political institutions, right? And that if you're getting a sanction from the state, if you're going to ask the state legislature for a charter of incorporation, how is that going to happen exactly? That means that a majority of the members of the New York State Assembly and the New York State Senate both have to agree to grant your particular charter of incorporation, and the governor has to sign off on it. And in New York, there's for a lot of the time that we're talking about here, there's this other council that has to sign off on this too. It's a sort of executive legislative hybrid called the Council of revision. They have to give their thumbs up on this too. And so how does that happen, right? You have to organize and mobilize politically to get majorities of votes in these different chambers to get your charter approved. So the moment you decide that you want to get a charter of incorporation, you are entering the political world, right? Whether or not you want to, this is going to be a political process because there's discretion on the other side of the table. The legislators can always say, you know what? We don't want to do this right now. We don't have to do it. There's not a specific need right now. We can wait another year. We can wait until there's a different cohort of people asking for one. and Maybe we like them better than we like you. And the bank itself is operating in a somewhat political way, or at least in a way that can become seen as political because bank boards of directors, they're chosen through a shareholder election. So there's already a sort of political process at play. But once the bank is operating, that decision about who gets to open an account, who's going to get credit, how much credit they're going to get, how much leeway they're going to get in their ability to you know, either overdraft or you know, have some breathing space with the board of directors to do whatever it is that they want to do, that's going to depend on the relationships that that person has and the standing that that person has. And so the board of directors has this incredible amount of discretion. And really, no, there's no moment of public accountability. They don't have to release their notes of their meetings or transcripts of their conversations or anything like this. This all happens in a black box. So if, let's say you ask for a loan or you ask for credit and you get denied. You know, is it because you didn't meet the right people? Yeah, maybe. Is it because somebody doesn't like you? Certainly possible. Is it because you're voting the wrong way or people think that your politics are wrong? You might think that. And so the whole practice of banking lends itself to 
On one hand, the act of trying to get a charter is an explicitly political process. On the other hand, the operations of a bank can often be interpreted through a political lens. And gradually, I think those two things will merge, especially when existing banks start arguing that they shouldn't have rivals and they shouldn't have competition. And certain groups of people begin to realize hey, we're not getting to do any of this stuff. And the Bank of New York, it looks an awful lot like just Alexander Hamilton and his friends are the only ones who could do business at the Bank of New York. So enter the Manhattan Company. Aaron Burr and Robert Livingston and the Clinton family, George Clinton, the governor of New York, they're all roughly allies in that they're Democratic Republicans. None of them are particularly, for various reasons, they're not considering themselves Federalists anymore. In some cases, it's ideological. In some cases, it's just careerism. It could be both. They would like, and particularly Aaron Burr, looks at what the Bank of New York can do. They can make loans to their friends. Commerce in New York is sort of explicitly associated with the Federalist cause. And Burr, I think, realizes that if Democratic Republicans want to play politics in New York City, they have to be able to win over merchants. You have to. And you can't have this narrative out there that, you know, all commerce is just dependent upon the Federalists. Right? We have to find a way to break that narrative. The easy way to do that would be to just start your own bank. The problem with that is that Hamilton and his pals have, after a, the panic of 1792, created this story that New York City can't support two banks that New York City isn't a big enough town to support two banks. If you have a second bank in the city, it's going to cause a speculative panic and this explosion of credit, and you're going to have bubbles and you're going to have a crash afterwards. And New York State's legislature is not going to sign off on a second bank charter. So if you ask for one, go for it, but they're going to say no. Burr sees an opening when the city of New York is trying to deal with the yellow fever epidemics. Their solution is to create a water company because they've gotten a report saying the problem with yellow fever is that people are drinking from this disgusting reservoir that used to be on Canal Street called the Collect. If you're driving across lower Manhattan on Canal Street, there's a point sort of near Nolita in Chinatown where the road dips down a little bit, right? It's kind of a basin. That basin had been a reservoir. So you think of what the puddles on Canal Street are like after it rains, and then imagine drinking out of that. This is not a great source of drinking water. The Manhattan Company is going to be this water company. The city of New York is going to ask for a charter from the state of New York to incorporate a water utility. Aaron Burr is a member of the state legislature, and there's this bipartisan committee of people who are supporting this thing, including Hamilton. Burr says, I'm a state lawmaker. You know, I know the ins and outs of Albany. Let me handle the approval of this charter. Everybody signs off on it. When Burr gets it into the legislature, at a point in the legislative process, he makes some amendments to the text of the proposed charter so that the new company will have the ability to do whatever it likes with any surplus capital that it has left over that's not being used for its water operations. At the same time, he enlarges the board of directors too, so that it has more seats on it. And this is a point where the way that you're getting this passed is that you're signaling to people who's going to be on the board of directors, effectively making bribes. You can promise people that you're going to be a director of this company once we get started, or maybe it's in the text of the bill itself. And you're also telling people, look, we're going to be selling stock shares. There's going to be a lot of demand. I can make sure that when we drop the list of who's going to actually be eligible to buy, I can make sure that you're on that list. And so when this company is finally approved, they have this ability to do whatever they want with their surplus capital. Lo and behold, the board of directors is larded with Clintonians and Livingstons and Burrites, and Federalists are now in the minority, whereas it had been evenly split beforehand. And when the shares are offered for sale, huh, they're owned by these three factions of Democratic Republicans who are now owning a majority of the shares of this company, and the Federalists are now in the minority. And one of the first moves at one of their first board meetings is that the Manhattan Company, right, this water company, is going to take the money that it's raised through its share sale, and they're going to turn around and open up an office of deposit and discount with that. Right? They're going to open up a bank. This is the way that Berg uses the incorporation process, uses the internal improvement agenda of the state of New York and of the city of New York to open up a bank that, in his mind, is now creating political parity to establish Democratic Republicans on the same footing as Federalists in New York City's banking regime. Did the Manhattan Company ever build the infrastructure that it needed to improve New York City's water? 
Yeah, they did. And as we can imagine, it's more expensive than it was estimated and predicted, but they do build some of it. It's not all that profitable. And they spend a good amount of time trying to sell it off and just trying to cleave the company and have you know the water thing be its own thing and have the banking thing be its own thing. But that remains in the charter for long enough that even at the beginning of the 20th century, the Manhattan Company, which is later absorbed into Chase, and then Chase is later absorbed in the J.P. Morgan. So, you know, the dueling pistols that are used at the Burr-Hamilton duel are just outside the office of Jamie Dimon, the chairman of J.P. Morgan. They've been in the custody of that company ever since. The Manhattan Company used to have, even in the beginning of the 20th century, had a well in their basement. And there was, you know, every year they'd have to open that thing up to maintain this legal fiction that they were operating a water utility to justify the underlying charter they'd been given by the state of New York. So thus far, this legal toolkit has proved very successful for New York in that it mobilized privately owned capital and steered it towards implementing some internal improvements. Now, we've seen how the state used the power to charter corporations and how they've used banks. So why don't we look at one more tool in this kit? Brian, would you tell us about the monopoly that New York State granted to Robert R. Livingston and Robert Fulton? And how the state benefited from granting them a monopoly? The monopoly is another one of these British imperial royal holdovers that states feel like they have an ability to use. And in some cases, right, if you granted a corporate charter, a lot of times the privilege that people were seeking was they'd call it their, an exclusive right. So when all the bankers are trying to get charters in the 1780s, they're always asking for an exclusive right. And that means that they want to be the only bank in New York. The state is going to promise, if you give us this charter, one of the things you're promising us is that you're not going to give anyone else a charter. We're going to be the only ones here. If you disconnect that from the corporate side of it, it's exactly what it sounds like. Livingston and Fulton, and this is around a steamboat, right? The idea being the British have a steam engine. Americans aren't manufacturing them yet. But take a steam engine, attach a wheel to it, and figure out how to get the engine to turn the wheel, and then put that on the deck of a boat. Boom, you got a steamboat. You got a steamboat, you can go up the Hudson River, you can go to Albany, you can go all the way up to Lake Champlain. You can master the current of the Hudson River. And one of the problems that New York has at this point, this is why they're going to be interested in Canal too, is that if you look at the map of New York's rivers, especially the Hudson, which is you know, the corridor to the interior of the state, unless you're catching the wind the right way, this is very inconvenient that the Hudson River flows southward. Right? If you're in New York City, you're always going to have to go upriver. And if you want to do that by wind, it's going to take you a long time. So the appeal is natural that you would want to correct the fact that the river flows in the wrong direction for you in some way. Livingston and Fulton are able to get a monopoly to get the New York legislature to promise them, look, if you develop a steamboat that you can publicly prove works, we are going to let you be the only guys who can run a steamboat in New York State for 20 years. And for every boat that you add into your flotilla, we'll extend it by X number of years. So the state can promise that. Sovereign act. And Livingston is able to wrangle this charter, not because he's some fabulous engineer. He doesn't know anything about this. He can't get this stuff to work. But he's a very well-connected judge. He's from a very wealthy family who's been involved in New York state politics for a very long time. Livingston has a lot of friends in Albany. And so he's able to wrangle this charter from the state of New York by basically getting them to reassign it to him, even though he doesn't have any technical expertise. In walks Robert Fulton, young strapping engineer who Livingston meets and then you know realizes, oh, this is the guy who can help me turn this monopoly grant, which if I don't produce this boat pretty soon, the offer on the table is going to expire and then I'm going to be left with nothing. He can help me get a boat on the water and help me get it functioning. So you've got this marriage of political connection and capital with technical expertise in this pairing of these two gentlemen that allow them to take the monopoly grant that Livingston had been given by New York State and turn it into a steamboat empire that they want to use to dominate New York State's steam commerce and everything throughout the region too. How did New York State benefit from granting Livingston and Fulton a monopoly? Well, they don't have to spend any money on this. It doesn't cost them anything to do it. So if you think about it, there's a precedent for it. It's like offering a big bounty or a big prize. The state had said, all right, you can get this privilege if you can demonstrate this technology. It doesn't cost them anything. To lawmakers, it's appealing because if you want to see steamboats happen, you know, you don't want to spend any money on it. 
because the state doesn't want to directly engage in these experiments. Let's make someone else shoulder the cost of that. If it doesn't work, it's not our problem. It's not our fault. But we would like to see steamboats happen because our river is flowing the wrong way and we'd like to see internal commerce developed in our hinterlands. Then it makes sense, right? And it's easy for them to do. If it doesn't become a reality, you don't have anything to worry about. You haven't spent anything. You could just reassign the grant to someone else. And if it does, it's the policy outcome that you were looking for to begin with. The trouble is that once Fulton and Livingston have one steamboat and then two steamboats and people see them in public and someone says, you know, I can build one of these too, then the monopoly is going to come back to the state lawmakers and say, look, you promised us an exclusive right and there's someone else operating a boat. I want you to do something about it. And the thing that I'm going to ask you to do about it is I want to be able to take their boat. If there's someone else operating an illegal steamboat on New York waters, I want to be able to just seize the boat. And I want you to give us the police power to take their boat and to drag them into court. That works only if the people who are rivals have no political clout whatsoever, but they do. And then you've got this fight between two camps about the legitimacy of not so much of steamboat technology, but about whether or not it was ever proper to grant a monopoly to these two guys in the first place and whether or not this is something that states in the United States should be doing. And that's the fight that they spend a lot of their time waging and that Robert Livingston especially spends a tremendous amount of energy on trying to fight and defend this monopoly in court over and over again. And eventually what happens is that it's allowed to exist within the boundaries of New York, but they're not allowed to do anything interstate because John Marshall in the Gibbons v. Ogden decision says New York State isn't allowed to pass a law that impedes interstate commerce. And there's no reason that someone with a New Jersey steamboat shouldn't be able to land it at New York. Brian, what lessons did New York State learn from incorporating and interacting with banks, corporations and monopolies? And how did these lessons convince New Yorkers that the Erie Canal, the biggest internal improvement project in early America needed to be a state-funded project. The lesson that I think is apparent by the time the canal is approved in 1817 is that you can live with corporations. You know, you can find ways to tame them by limiting their lifespan and effectively writing boundaries into corporate charters when you can't really justify anymore in New York State are monopolies. The Livingston Fulton thing is going to keep going on, but nobody really wants it to keep going on. You know, they barely survive the fights that they're waging to hold on to that monopoly. So the lesson is corporations are really effective tools for mobilizing capital. People are interested in investing in them. They're good ways to harness money. They're good ways to deploy money. They're pretty efficient tools that the state has to make money move around and to steer it in ways that they would like to. And they've got a banking regime that's growing and that's dynamic and it's really unstable, but it's also, it can be effective for mobilizing capital and providing investment money for things that you would like to see get done. But you can't have monopolies. The reason you want to do a canal is just think about the map of New York. You go up the Hudson River on a steamboat to Albany. You want to get west. Well, there's a river there. There's the Mohawk River. But it would be so much better if you had a canal to take you from Albany out to Buffalo. And then you get to the Great Lakes. And once you get to the Great Lakes, you can get to the west. So if you want to open up the New York State hinterland and you want to connect New York City to the West, building a canal is a way to do it, right? And they're looking abroad. They can look at British examples of this. They're realizing that they have the engineering capacity to actually do a project like this. What they don't want to do is to give to some guy, just some random guy who's going to say, you know what? I'll build you the canal. I'll put the money up. You just have to grant me the right to collect tolls on it and set the toll rates. And, you know, me and my family get to own it for the next hundred years or something like that. And that's exactly what happens when they're talking about how to fund the Erie Canal. What they eventually do is they finance it through public bonds because they don't want a private entity to own it. They want it to be a public asset and they want it to be under public control. And the only reason they can even do that is because they've built up this capacity by chartering banks to have enough savings and enough investment capital on hand in New York City to be able to fund a canal. And they've reestablished international trade to the point where a lot of the buyers of canal bonds are going to be British bankers. So you've, the canal, this public project, is going to be built on the back of New York State's experience in creating a mixed economy, public and private banking system, and their experiments in using monopolies and seeing what monopolies can do for them in the creation of turnpikes and steamboat monopoly and other transportation enterprises. It's a culmination of you know, roughly 
30 years of experience in dealing with and having conversations about what you do with monopolies and corporations in the new republic. And that leads them to decide in 1817, you know what, we're going to do this publicly. We're going to sell bonds. We're going to have the tolls collected, finance the interest payments on the bonds, and we're going to have this thing be constructed by regular folks who are paid privately, but it's going to be a public enterprise. You've given us a really great idea of how early New York politics and economics work to create the state's early republic political economy. But how does having a better understanding of how early American state governments structured and interacted with their economies help us better understand our own present day political economy? I think it helps us because when we look at and when we have conversations about what bank regulation looks like and should look like and what the role of government is in ordering and regulating and defining our economic transactions and our economic relationships, we can look back and I think there's a lot that we can learn from the debates that people have about corporations in the 18th and 19th century because they realize that, first of all, corporations are not natural entities, right? They only exist because as a policy, people have decided through the state that this is an efficient and effective way to organize capital. It's not because they're natural, right? There's no natural right that you and I have to create a fictional person. This only exists because there's a state. And so I think studying this helps you find a framework to understand how political our economy can actually be and understand why it is that regulation is often necessary as a corrective to the instincts of a company or of an industry that would like to operate in a way that can be harmful to the public interest or to the public good. I think it helps you articulate a stronger defense of what the state's role is in the economy. And it helps you fundamentally understand that there isn't a marketplace without the state. You know, this idea that the 20th century gave us the free market of the stateless market where individuals have relationships with one another that are transactional and that have nothing to do with state policy and that could exist in a stateless world, right? That just doesn't hold up. These are all happening within a mixed economy that's public and private. They're all happening as matters of policy and matters of law. And the state's role here is much greater than I think we often realize today. And so when we hear the heads of the country's banks say, we do a good enough job that we shouldn't be regulated, or when they complain about regulation, or when they complain about the burdens of having to answer to Congress, or when they come and ask for bailout money, as happened in 08, I think it helps us reset our understanding of how these institutions evolved and what their real relationship to the state and to the polity are and what obligations each side has to one another through that connection. I think it helps us make better sense of what corporations are in their basic nature and how we might begin to wrap our arms around the policy implications that come with that. It's time for the Time Warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The Time Warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. In your opinion, what might have happened if the Erie Canal had not been built by the state of New York as a public project? I think that any private entity that would have tried to build it would have run out of money, and I think the project probably would never have gotten done. And if it hadn't been built, New York City wouldn't have evolved as it did in the 19th century. And it would be Hartford. (laughs) It would be Hartford with a good harbor. Or it would be more akin to what Philadelphia or Wilmington or Baltimore are, a place where finance didn't get the same hold. And I think the interior of New York would look a bit different than it does today. You wouldn't have had that manufacturing boom. I mean, railroads would have stepped in to fill some of that space. But I think the canal is the proof of concept of a particular way of thinking about economic development that makes the railroad boom evolve the way it did. And so if you didn't have that canal happen, I think that all might have just taken longer to get off the ground and New York City just wouldn't look like it does today. Now that you've explored early American political economy, what aspect of history are you researching now? Corruption, which is always timely. (laughs) 
I've been interested in it for a while. And then I was doing some work on current political stuff and got even more interested in some of these questions. We've read a lot about virtue and the role of virtue in the formation of the Republic and the way that people thought about virtue and citizenship. And I'm interested in the flip side of that coin, right? If you can define what you value and what you prize, you also have the ability to define what's unacceptable. And I'm interested in how the definition of corruption changes from the time when we're talking about it in the 1760s and the time when we're looking at the corruption of the British Empire of imperial officials and imperial policies to when we're looking at it as something that's actually domestically manufactured and occurring in a domestic context. And so I'm interested in how the definition and understanding of corruption changes from the 1760s through the revolution into the early republic and how it manifests itself in laws and in different cases and who gets punished and who didn't get the memo and ends up stepping over a line and how they understand their position and how people are beginning to understand the concept of office holding and public corruption and bribery and what the lawmaking and election processes should look like. Where should we look for more information about you, Brian, and how we can contact you if we still have questions about political economy and the early republic history of New York State? I have a website, brianphillipsmurphy.com, and there's a link there where you can email me. You can also follow me on Twitter at Burrite. The website also has links to things that I'm writing in history and things that I'm writing over at Talking Points Memo and other places. That's a good portal to just get a hold of me. Brian Murphy, thank you for giving us a glimpse at how New York became the Empire State and for helping us better understand political economy and the role it played in building the early United States. Thanks very much, Liz. Really appreciate it. It seems like we found an answer to the question of how New Yorkers rebuilt New York City after the revolution. They used the state to organize and incorporate banks that directed money towards internal improvements. In fact, the Bank of New York and the Manhattan Company proved to be so successful that they helped convince New Yorkers to try other state-sponsored measures to help their state and city economies thrive. Between the 1790s and early 1800s, New York State incorporated banks, turnpikes, and two canal companies, the Northern and Western Inland Lock Navigation Companies, which Brian discusses in some detail in his book. All of these projects, the banks, turnpikes and canals, and even the Livingston Fulton Steamboat Monopoly, helped improve New York State. The state created banks, which funneled money into the economy, which people in turn used to invest in internal improvements, which made it possible to bring more people into the state, you know, because now New York had good roads, canals, and a system of credit. And for these people to send the goods they produced, and to send them quickly to the marketplace in New York City. Which brings us to the point that Brian made at the end of our conversation. From these examples, it really does seem like the state created the marketplace. Check out the show notes page for more information about Brian, his book, Building the Empire State, plus everything we talked about today, benfranklinsworld.com slash 113. As a listener of Ben Franklin's World, I know that you really enjoy high-quality, well-researched history. And your appreciation for this high-quality history is why you should visit the Cornell University Press website. Cornell Press publishes great and interesting history books, like Ken Miller's Dangerous Guests. So why not click the link in your Ben Franklin's World app or visit benfranklinsworld.com Cornell to discover more about Cornell University Press and their great selection of titles. Okay, knowing what we know about political economy and how it operates, do you think the early American economy would have developed as fast as it did without assistance from local, state, and national governments? Let me know. Send your answers to Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or post a comment on the show notes page or in our listener community on Facebook. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.